Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, as, as I said, it's a pleasure to uh, speak in this uh, symposium. So uh, I'm going to follow on from, uh, from, from Kim's very nice presentation, uh, show you a few more examples of using these pipette-based uh, nanoprobes to visualize electrochemical interfaces and um, really develop this theme, which is to correlate electrochemical maps and electrochemical movies with co-located correlative microscopy. So I'll give you a few examples of how we do this. Um, but the other thing that we're really starting to push now in our group at Warwick is to then ask the question, how do these nanoscale measurements really translate to a larger scale, you know, macroscopic devices, which of course are of, of, of practical use. Um, and we've I've been very fortunate, or we're, we're very fortunate at Warwick University, who have some fabulous people who've contributed to the development of these techniques um, over the last decade or so. The work I'm going to talk about today has really been led by Cameron Bentley, um, Minkian Kang, and uh, there's some data in here from Enrico Davidi, and um, also from Lewis Yule, and uh, finally from... Bao Ping Chen, so um, and Bing Ling Tao. So I'd really like to thank thank them for, for their, their contributions. And as I said, as I mentioned, um, we've been working on this for about a, a decade or so. Um, Kim was an early pioneer in our group, and and various other people. It's been very international. And a number of these people who've come through the group uh, have now set up their own groups and are using nano pipette based methods. Um, in their own groups. I think that's a pretty good advert for the reliability of some of these techniques, the fact that people are taking them on and develop, developing them now all around the world, which is, is fabulous. So um, here's, the basic, here's the basic idea then. Uh, if we look at any kind of electrode that we might want to study, um, whether it's uh, what we might call a very well-defined electrode, a layered material, for example, as, we, as we've just heard about, um, I'll use my laser pointer actually, uh, a, a layered material, uh, something like highly oriented pyrolytic graphite. Um, these surfaces still have defects uh, which may contribute to the electrochemical activity or may have different activity to the, the surrounding uh, basal surface. Um, but actually most of the materials that we study in electrochemistry tend to be more complex, so they might be polycrystalline, they might have different compositions, they'll certainly have grain boundaries, and a, and a lot of these features have remained hidden in terms of their electrochemical uh, characteristics. And, and what the scan probe microscopy techniques that I'm going to talk about uh, today allow us to do is to really start to do things like grain boundary electrochemistry, direct grain boundary electrochemistry, or to look at particular facets on a, a polycrystalline uh, electrode surface. Um, and then finally, you know, a lot of, of practical materials involve particles on surfaces as well. Uh, these are very dynamic, but the particles themselves might have uh, different properties, different structures, be adhered in different ways to that surface. And again, a macroscopic measurement, a conventional electrochemical measurement, really won't tell us very much about the components, right? So what we're trying to do is what we call single entity electrochemistry. So that's, can we do electrochemistry directly on a single step? or a basal surface, can we do electrochemistry directly and map at a grain boundary or a particular facet? Can we target a single particle and, and map and, and measure its electrochemistry using these, these scan probe uh, microscopy techniques? And so the key technique I'm going to be talking about today is, is scanning electrochemical cell microscopy, okay? And the reason we call it scanning electrochemical cell uh, microscopy is because the probe is an electrochemical half cell or a conductivity cell, which also serves as an electrochemical uh, cell or a voltammetric amperometric cell. Um, so Kim's already introduced these kind of probes, but let me just sort of emphasize, you know, that it's very versatile, this technique. We can use a single probe on a conducting surface, and there the feedback or the sensing of the, the probe with the surface is, is that when the meniscus lands on the surface and, and that's without the probe itself contacting the surface, we close an electrochemical cell and we get a, a very brief charging current and we can use that as our feedback to stop the motion of the probe, for example, if we're approaching it normal to the surface. And so, you know, this hopping type mode is a really nice mode to, to visualize surfaces. And, and then when we land the meniscus on the surface, 
we can essentially carry out any conventional electrochemical measurement. So we can scan the potential, linear sweep voltammetry, and measure the current response, a standard electrochemical measurement. We're doing some work in our group at the moment doing impedance spectroscopy, for example. We can do chronopotentiometry. So a nice thing about this technique is we can bring the whole myriad of electrochemical techniques into this tiny droplet format. Um, the dual barrel probe is, is, was our original in, invention. And this is really useful if you have a surface which comprises insulating material and conducting material, because you, now you need a different way for the droplet to sense the surface. So in this case, we apply a small bias between two quasi-reference counter electrodes in this theta pipette that, that Kim mentioned, and that conductance current changes when the meniscus lands on the surface. So again, we can use this in a hopping mode or we can move the meniscus across the surface. So both techniques will build up a map or a dynamic, the dynamic properties of the surface, but they also track the topography. So this is the, the other aspect of this technique that we particularly like, is, that the, is the fact that we can do both topography and activity synchronously. And um, this was really brought to the fore when, when, when Kim was in our group because he reconfigured our SECCM or our electrochemical probe uh, platform, introduced the use of an FPGA card. We started to introduce lock-in amplifiers because we can do mod modulation of the probe position as well. So a whole plethora of different ways of imaging with this technique and it's, it's become a very robust uh, technique for us. Um, I thought actually it might be useful to just go through a few practical considerations because people who are, who are new to this technique often ask questions about things like, well, what's the meniscus stability? Do you have wetting on the surface? Um, uh, what about this quasi-reference counter electrode and so on? So I thought I'd just go through a few examples to show you that, you know, this in, indeed is a very robust technique now uh, and, and can be used uh, in, in a fairly straightforward manner. So how do we know about the size of this meniscus cell, for example, and its stability? I'll actually start over here. The most simple way to do this is actually to visualize, we're doing a hopping mode where we land the meniscus on a surface, pull it away and move to another spot on the surface. We can go back afterwards and analyze those meniscus residues with, um, with AFM, for example, or SEM. And you can see here, beautiful uniform uh, footprints on this surface. Um, with uh, this dual probe, we, we did some measurements in the early days where we had a, a very fine conducting element. So this was a, a single wall carbon nanotube, just one nanometer in size. And you can see that this is basically, as well as a, a means of visualizing the activity of the nanotube, it's basically a meniscus size reader, right? Because when the meniscus, if we move the meniscus over this surface, the the current switches on when the forward, the, the front edge of the meniscus encounters the, uh, the, the nanotube and then the current switches off when the, when the droplet leaves the meniscus, uh, leaves the nanotube. So a really beautiful way to size the meniscus. Um, and the dual channel probe, the conductance currents uh, between the two quasi-reference counter electrodes with an applied bias, that also tells us a little bit about the meniscus geometry and how stable it is. So there are various ways that we can really prove that this kind of meniscus is, is stable and, um, and we can characterize its size. So uh, the other thing that's, that's important to bear in mind when we're doing uh, electrochemistry is thinking about what the current flows is. So Kim uh, showed you at the end there, a nice console simulation of, of diffusion and I guess also uh, migration of uh, ruthenium hexamine down the barrel to the, to the electrode surface. We also have to you know, think about, um, is there some resistance to the current flow from the, from the pipette itself, as well as from the electrochemistry? And a simple way to do that is just to do this kind of uh, current voltage curve measurement where you just have the probe on its own, filled with the electrolyte solution in a bath, apply a, a, a bias, a linearly scanned bias in this case, and measure the current response and, and we, we can simply back out the resistance there and then we can set you know a value for the current that we'd like to measure from the surface uh, assuming that there's a certain uh, ohmic term that we can tolerate so you can see here again that you know we can pass pretty large current densities in, in this technique without having to worry about ohmic effects providing we've got plenty of 
supporting electrolyte around to carry that current. So again, these are very simple things that, that one can do as an experimenter to check, check the measurements that are being made. An important consideration is, you know, what's, we, we tend to think, well, we're just playing a, a potential between our surface and this quasi-reference counter electrode. This quasi-reference counter electrode is large, so there's no charge transfer resistance at that electrode. Um, but we do have to think about what might happen at this electrode over time and whether the, the products of this electrode, because we're carrying out an electrochemical reaction here as well as at the surface, whether there's, there's uh, diffusion or migration down the, the barrel to this, this endpoint. And uh, Cameron Bentley did these beautiful experiments a couple of years ago. We, we never saw any problems, but we, there was a paper that came out that said, oh, there can be problems with these kind of electrodes. So Cameron did these beautiful uh, experiments showed under various conditions that you can basically image uh, for long times with, with this technique without any issues of this kind. Um, he did a, an experiment where he deli deliberately uh, placed this silver silver chloride electrode in the back of the probe in a, in a, in a let's just say a rough manner um, and uh, a little fragment of silver chloride broke off and then in that case you know after a very brief time you have some problems, you start to see silver chloride appearing on your surface, messing up your, your electrochemical process and contaminating the surface. And it's because of a bad placement of this electrode. Um, this, these electrodes are also very stable. I think that's important in terms of their potential. So again, you know, a drift in the potential of about a millivolt per hour. So beautiful in terms of doing, uh, in this very simple two electric format, in terms of doing uh, very nice work on, on uh, assessing catalysts and so on. If, if you get worried about um, these kind of issues, although they're really not problematic, you can go to a three electric format as well. Although most recent work on, uh, on CO2 reduction has used a, a two electric format. Um, so here's the idea. You have all day, if you want to, to do, do SECCM before you have any of these kind of issues. Um, and then a lot of the work I'm going to talk about today is, um, is basically carried out, you know, on a, just on a, a, a bench top, on a, a vibration isolation table, um, often just, just in an ambient environment. Um, but it's possible to very easily do these measurements under environmental control with a simple uh, box that you can buy from Amazon or somewhere, just one of these sandwich boxes that can just be modified for a couple of pounds and uh, you can get a really nice atmospheric control. Uh, you can also do SECCM in a glove box quite straightforwardly as well, and, and that's something um, that's, that's ongoing. So it's, it's a versatile technique and quite easy to use. Um, again, I'm going to mainly talk about uh, work that's in aqueous solution, but Cameron very recently did this nice study to show that SECCM can be used in, in a very straightforward manner with aprotic solvents as well, the types of solvents that would be used in, in battery electrodes. Um, did the same kind of things, you know, look at how stable the droplet is when you land that on a surface, uh, do some electro deposition measurements so that you can look at the footprints uh, on that surface, uh, show that uh, simple outer sphere redox processes are very consistent across that surface. So there's many thousands of individual current voltage curve measurements here and this is the average of all of those curves and that's one standard deviation so it's a very very reproducible response and again the um the quasi-reference counter electrode in the in these systems uh, is really really stable um and then finally just to point out you know again just thinking about the di diversity of environments so we did some work recently zinc electrochemistry and we use this kind of configuration so an aqueous solution in the pipette and an organic solvent around there so we can start to do three phase seccm as well so there are lots of possibilities that we might envisage with this with this type of approach okay so i'll just give you a few examples really just to show the diversity of, of, uh, of, of materials that you can look at. So I'll pick up with, uh, with a system that, that Kim was actually looking at. Uh, he was looking at one layer, two layers, and three layers of, of, of some of these 2D materials. Um, some work that we did in the group was to actually look at the, the natural crystal of uh, molybdenite and really try and assess, can we you know, really quantify precisely what's the edge plane kinetics versus the basal plane kinetics? And we can do that just on a, on a cleaved surface because the cleaved surface has the basal plane 
and it has um, the edge plane. And this is work again from, from Cameron. And so we can do our experiment where you know, we land the meniscus on that surface, we're running a current voltage curve at every single pixel here uh, across that surface, and we reconfigure that in a movie, which you would have uh, just seen playing on the left-hand side there. Um, and we can then go in and we can dig out that data um, at a particular potential. So here we're looking at the final potential and we can see immediately that we can see a difference as reflected in the currents here in the uh, kinetics of the edge plane versus the basal plane. How do we know there's um, an edge plane there? Um, well, we can see that because we can go afterwards with AFM and we can um, record this area here that we're looking at and we can see very nicely there's a macro step here of a few tens of nanometer height. There's also a very fine step here and we can see that that also has enhanced activity. Um, but clearly the, the extent to which the activity is enhanced at the edge plane depends on the height of the edge plane. Right? So whether we've got a big step here we have a significant enhancement in the current, we have this tiny step and we have a small enhancement in the current. Um, and so basically what we've done is that every single pixel we've run one of these linear sweep voltammograms and um, what you can do is you can go in and you can fish out the current voltage response at that particular plane. So here we can say that's the current voltage response from which we can get the kinetics of the pure basal surface. Here we're measuring the basal surface plus the edge and here we're measuring the basal surface plus the macroscopic edge okay and then we can go a little bit further um, because we can convert these for example to tafel plots for those different locations and because we we can look with the AFM at where we were on that surface and we know the size of the footprint we can do we can convert our currents to current densities we can work out the proportion of the basal surface to the edge and so we can pull out the TAFL response or the kinetics for the edge. So we've got the response for the pure basal surface, the response for the edge and the response for basal plus edge. So we can now pull out reliable values for the current densities for the basal surface and the edge surface and we can benchmark these particular features of a surface now against uh, other materials. And I will say, you know, these data if you look in the literature, there's a really wide variety of, of exchange current densities. And those measurements in the literature are made on a macroscopic scale, really where you, it's difficult to determine what the structure of the, the material is. Here, we can precisely know what the, the material is. Um, and this was a follow-up paper from, from, from Cameron, which is really showing you know, how, how you can take this technique further. So 30 nanometer probes can be used very easily uh, you pull out the activity and just to emphasize again with SECCM you get the topography for free so you always get synchronous topography activity with this technique. We've been looking a little bit at corrosion related processes in the group recently and here now the correlative technique that we use is SEM scanning electron microscopy with electron backscatter diffraction. Uh, to really reveal what the crystallography or the surface crystallography of that surface is. And then if we do EDS as well, we can uh, determine something about variations in the chemistry, particularly identify uh, inclusions, manganese sulfide inclusions, for example. And we've, we've been doing work looking at the electrodissolution and also some of these cathodic processes which drive the, uh, the corrosion reaction. And I'll just show you, I think, one slide to sort of emphasize the level of detail that you can get about these materials. So this is, this is work from Lewis Yule. And uh, again, here's an SEM image now after an experiment uh, where you can look at all of these droplets and you can see here that within the scan range that, or scan area, there were two inclusions and uh, those inclusions show enhanced activity. Um, and also he was able to show that there are certain grain boundaries grain boundaries, which have enhanced activity. Sorry, I'm looking at the clock here, realizing I need to go a bit faster. And there are some other grain boundaries which are basically electrochemically silent compared to the surrounding grains. So we can really start to pinpoint where are the active sites that will drive the corrosion reaction in a direct way. 
Uh, I think this might be the final, or one of the, uh, we're getting close to final examples here. This is now looking at the um, electrochemistry of a, a composite uh, polymer electrode, just to sort of show how we can diversify some of these materials. Um, and so this was a collaboration with the University of Arizona, uh, and uh, we made these, or the uh, University of Arizona made these composite electrodes comprising an electrically insulating PMMA and a conducting P3HT, okay? And just to show you the kind of information you can get from this. So this is SECCM, this is synchronous topography again, and electrochemical activity. So you can see a nice correlation between the active domains and where the electrochemistry takes place. And then we've used these, what I call conventional microscopies, AFM, conducting AFM and optical microscopy in the same regions. Just look at these two, SECCM, it was never, it's never a, a pure topographical technique, but it gives you topography in a reasonable way, even compared to AFM, okay? So, and we get this together with the electrochemistry at the same time. We can process this data with models to get local kinetics across that surface. And so what we were able to do with this technique is, you know, do really detailed nanoscale analysis and make macroscopic measurements and ask the question, what does a local measurement tell you? What does a macroscopic measurement tell you? And the answer is the local measurement basically tells us about the kinetics. It tells us about the intrinsic electrochemistry of, of these interesting materials. A macroscopic measurement basically just tells you about the contact resistance or the film resistance. Okay, so it tells us nothing really about the redox reactions. And so putting these together really gives us a much more holistic view of what controls electrochemistry at different length scales. Um, and I probably ha don't have time to go through this, but I'll just quickly say, you know, I think um, this is going to be a great technique for looking at battery electrodes as well. We've started doing some work here looking at, uh, for example, this uh, uh, lithium manganese oxide cathode material, looking at single uh, particle activity. This is some data from Bing Lin Tao, which I think really illustrates this technique. You know, here's where he did these different scans. A lot of very successful scans here uh, during just a few days experiments. Um, you can go in with SEM afterwards, look at where you did those measurements, and then you can fish out the local electrochemical properties of particular um, particles. So we can start to do this single particle electrochemistry using this technique uh, in a really nice way and highlighting that different particles or different particles sitting on a conducting support have very different electrochemical properties. And we think this is going to be very important for, you know, designing battery, archi battery electrode architectures, uh, finding the optimal materials that we can use in some of these interesting electrochemical applications. Um, and just to finally highlight, you know, this technique is very versatile in terms of the substrates you can use. So you can do this directly, your material on a TM grid, then you can take your, your material off and, and do the electrochemistry, take it off, have a look at it in the TM, um, look at the electrochemistry of single clusters and, and that kind of thing. Um, and the final slide is just to say, you know, we did a lot of work in the early days of this technique on carbon materials, and, and that's summarized in this accounts of chemical research article. So these techniques are, are really easy to deploy, I think, certainly based on, on the work that um, the fabulous people in, in our group do. Um, I've talked about SECCM, but you can easily switch. You can, we can do SICM. We use this for doing charge mapping and also for visualizing ion fluxes. Um, you can use this kind of dual channel probe as well. Um, so we're in this area of multi-scale electrochemistry where we can target single entities. We can correlate the electrochemical response with other forms of microscopy. We can start to build these structure activity relationships in a lot of detail. And we can also put together multi-scale activity model that give us a much more holistic view of what's happening in, in some of these interesting electrode materials. And then just to also emphasize, this is not just an imaging technique, right? I think the key thing is each of those spots that I showed you, that you could do a different electrochemical measurement in each spot, or you could have a graded sample with a lot of different materials. So it's a beautiful platform for doing combinatorial electrochemistry, making thousands of different measurements in an array. You can look at unusual substrates like TEM grids. Uh, you can do direct grain boundary electrochemistry and the work that's been done in the group recently has shown that you can really diversify the range of solvents and the kind of environments you can study. So I think we're really well set for using this technique for materials characterization. 
And then I've acknowledged the people at the beginning who did the work. And we've also, we've got a nice group of people at Warwick work on these techniques with myself and, and Julia McPherson and a number of people who supported the work. And I apologize, Justina, for, for going over. No worries, Pat, we are still in time, but we have time just for one question, I would say. So let's take the first one uh, coming from Rebecca Savage. Um, so the question is, when there are sharp height changes, does the tip um, or meniscus convulsion affect the measurements? Sorry, what was that, uh, Justina? You can also see this question in Q&A if you put yeah, I'm, I'm I'm trying to get rid of my uh, laser pointer without success, but carry on. All right. Shall I repeat the question for you? Yes, please. Yeah. The question is, when there are sharp height changes, does yeah. the tip convulsion affect the measurement? Um, I guess it would depend on, it's, it's all relative, right? The height change, uh, if we're looking at a step edge or something compared to the uh, uh, meniscus size. So you'd have, you would really tune your probe size according to the features that you think you're going to be looking at. So um, I think it will be very difficult, for example, to sort of map down the side of a step or something like that. So I think as long as you're sensible about choosing your tip size, like, like you would do um, in, in any technique, I think, you know, really think about what the interaction is between the probe and the meniscus and the surface. 